do we keep the planet moving towards a greener future? It doesn't, it doesn't happen without driven entrepreneurs and inspired social impact leaders like you. Yeah. This podcast will give the tools and insight you need to join the sustainability movement and save the world. This is Thinking Green with Mohammed Abdullah. Welcome, Thinking Green Nation. This is your host, Mohammed Abdallah. Today, I have Vincent Battaglia, CEO and founder of Renova Energy with me. How are you doing, Vince? Really good, Mo. How are you, sir? Vince, it's always such a pleasure to see your face, man. That smile of yours, it radiates like way beyond any area, the ambiance. I mean, just what is it, man? What do you do? Like, Great clarity of sunshine. <laughs> the white smile, like crest. I don't know what you do with those teeth, man. Those pearly oh, white. <laughs> um, Vince, when we before we get started, I uh, I kind of wanted to see if you recall the very first time that you and I met, and let's sync up and see if that that story correlates with with mine. Oh, I thought that that's a good way of putting it. I wasn't going to say anything, but I will. I'd like to tell everyone what a uh, what a, a, a fortuitous event <laughs> and night and day that was. If yeah, and then yeah, you're right. Let's see if it syncs up. I don't remember the conference. It was in Arizona. It was at a uh, resort where they have teepees. I don't know if you remember the teepees. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, We were having uh, the first night you get there, you do like a meet and greet with all of the different uh, solar installers from around the United States. So it was a major solar conference. Mm -hmm. And I just remember you with this big grin on your face, walking around like a 12 year old kid and talking to everybody and you had you had who was that young guy i forget his name hello people people riser people big tall kid Uh and he was wandering around with you look kind of like shaggy so you had scooby and shaggy walking through this (laughs) conference and just you guys looked so totally out of place but you were enjoying yourself and there were all these stuffed shirts everyone was drinking red wine Mm -hmm. and they had jackets on and you just had this great shitty grin on your face and you were just there to be happy. Mm-hmm. And I remember talking to you for, for like an hour. You just were going on and on about starting up your company and you had this great idea. And, you know, and I told you uh, I was a sun power dealer. And so I remember talking about all that with you. And then through a series of events, I find out that you guys don't have a place to stay, but you had a tent. <laughs> and you, you were going to sleep. I think you were going to pitch the tent out at this resort anywhere where you could find a green area. To, 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 and I'm thinking, these guys are good, man. This talk about bootstrapping your business, man. You must really have purpose and heart if you're going to come to an event like this and sleep out on the grass. And I remember saying, well, hey, I have this ground floor condo thing that I was staying in and I'll leave the back slider open and you guys can camp out on the patio back there and then you can use the bathroom and everything else. And I remember I went to sleep first, I think, and you guys stayed up and partied or did whatever the heck you did. And then um, the next morning I woke up and I'm ready to go to meetings and all that. And you guys were in this tent in the back. And I remember waking you up I'm like, hey, good morning. Room's open. You, I'm packed up. I'm going to leave today after I have my meetings. I'm out. Bathroom's open. Yeah. Bathroom's open. Come on in and just use it. Just remember to shut the door on your way out. Yeah. And then I, and that's how it began. And that's how I remember it, at least. How oh, was yeah. it? It's pretty accurate? There, I, I recall it the same way, except there's one minor detail. And I think it's something that stuck with me for so, so long. And that's that um, in the middle of the, the first day of the conference, um, I was actually sitting in a row behind you. And um, I raised my hand and I always have like this methodical way of asking questions. So I raised my hand and I said, hi, you know, my name is Muhammad Abdallah. I'm the founder of an early stage startup called Good Faith Energy. And I asked my question. And then I remember after the panel was done, uh, you turned around and you looked at me and you were like, hey, man, you know, tell me a little bit about your startup. And uh, and we just we just started talking. And I I felt like you took a super genuine interest because most people, you know, the reason why I I, I would open up like that is because I felt like the most genuine, the most sincere people uh, are, are givers. Right. I'm a giver by nature. And so, um, you know, whenever you talk about being a startup, um, you know, you basically turned around and you said, hey, 
Um, tell me about your startup, man. Tell me how I can help you out. Uh, tell me what, what it's all about. Like, what's, what's your passion? You know, why are you doing this? Um, and it was just such an incredible conversation. And then it kind of trickled into that evening and the kind of the cocktail event. And then after that, okay. all right. Um, so we did meet each other earlier in the day. Okay. Yes, yes, right. yes. Okay. That's it. How, okay. Um, all right. Well, but hey, man, we all got to start somewhere, and you you just looked like me in the beginning. So that I just I just thought that uh, yeah, you have a glow about you, man, which is uh, I, I have great respect for people who uh, try to just try to do good everywhere, and anyone who has good faith in their in the name of their company. I mean, talk about purpose driven. So, uh, yeah, you're just an all around good person. And like I said, I remember being where you were at. Um, and I know for damn sure that you are going to turn around to some kid, you know, at, at the next conference you're at and say, hey, what's your name? How are how you starting up? Let me hear your story. And then uh, throughout the years, yeah, you have um, genuinely shown me just great pride in what you do. And therefore, you make me very proud in, in, in knowing you. So you have you have a tremendous organization and a great spirit, and it shows in everything that you do. So thank you, Vince, and I think a lot of that's inspired by you. So let's kind of dive into the details. I want you to tell me a little bit about how Renova Energy got started, uh, what inspired you to start it, how you got started. Uh, kind of give me the download. I want you to dig deep. I know you guys have been around now for what about fifteen years, Vince? Fifteen, yeah. Um, fifteen years. Yeah. So uh, walk me through kind of those early stages, how you formed the business, what inspired you and uh, where you're at today. We um, in, uh, let's see, 2000, let's see, 1999, I'll go there. I returned to the United States from living in Russia for seven years. And in Russia, I had been exposed to not only, you know, different business practices, let's put it that like that, um, but uh, also renewable energy. And so I caught the bug there because in Europe, in Germany, Austria, uh, they use a lot. You know, they use the sun for the, um, the thermal aspect of the sun as well as the photovoltaic uh, response. And so I came to the U.S. in 19 or returned in 1999, uh, moved directly to the desert of Palm Desert. And my parents had a little condo out here. And I moved into this condo was thinking I had long, long hair coming back from Europe. I figured, what, you know, what am I going to do? I've got to do something, you know, start my own business because that's as a serial entrepreneur, I'm 55 now, I'm going to be 55. Uh, all of my life, I began when I was nine years old, mowing lawns, shoveling snow and, and delivering newspapers. So, you know, here I am in the desert. I have an opportunity now to press, restart and do whatever I want. I started a real estate company, um, which was focused on using recycled building uh, or construction materials in all of the, the buildings that we build. By 2005, I could see the economy was about to crash. And because it was super difficult to do any land deals or any real estate deals. And so uh, Fortune was smiling on me that year where um, an MBA program opened up, a master's program uh, in entrepreneurial management opened here locally in our desert. It was an extension of UC Riverside. And I was the first student accepted. And by 2000, it's a two year program. So 2005 to six, just general education. And then by the end of 2000, or the beginning of 2006, end of 2005, into the first year, they said, in order to graduate, you need to have a thesis, a capstone. And that capstone, you need to, to start that business in 2006 and then prove the concept. And, and you need to show that uh, on your final, final day, uh, mm -hmm in front of the professors and um, yeah, in order to graduate. So in 2006, I had a good bottle of wine and I could see that uh, I wanted to get into the energy space uh, of renewables because I could see that the only competition against the utilities was nobody. The utilities are the last remaining monopoly in the world. They are the last remaining monopoly. The one prior to that was 1982, that, got, that was the uh, phone companies and they got destroyed, uh, rightfully so, and cell towers and, and all the wonderful things that we can do with these came up. So I decided I'm going to get in the energy space. 
So I came up with the name Renova. Renova is short for Renovable. Renovable means renewable. And the idea was to prove the concept here in the United States, template it, and take it into Mexico Central and South America, where their infrastructure is actually far worse than in the U.S. So that was 2006. We installed three systems that year. I incorporated in 2007. We did about 300,000 in revenue that first year. Last year, we did nearly 40 million in revenue after 15 years. This year, we'll do well over 50 million in revenue. We have uh, 235 employees now. We became an ESOP back in uh, 2016. Uh, ESOP is an employee stock owned program. So we have employee owners. After a year, you, you become an employee owner. I give you shares in the company. Um, and so we have, an, once you have shares, you're an employee partner. Um, we have a bunch of firsts, which are kind of fun because the industry was just in its beginning stages when I started. So it's kind of fun to, you know, to explore and to be that pioneer. You know, you also catch the arrows too, but, but, you know, you get all the benefits of being able to meet startups like yourself mm -hmm. and show love. And then in return, get centuries of love. And you know, that's there's really no there is no other industry like the distributed generation industry, the microgrid industry that, that you and I are both in right now. So we're both very, 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 very fortunate to be living at this time. This is a, is a historically transitional period in humankind. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Vince, did I hear you right that you have 235 employees now? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we got through. I remember guys being around like the 150 mark, like you yeah. just. You know, one of the things that uh, inspires me about you is your passion for people um, and creating jobs. You know, you talk about it all the time, how you just love creating more and more jobs so that you can have more and more of a social impact and 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 really transform people's lives. What, what is it that really drives you about and makes you so passionate about people? Yeah, it, that that's it. It's, you, you know, you are nobody unless you can affect somebody in a positive way. Um, the, the thing I like doing is doing something nice for someone and then watching them pass that on. And we have a culture of that at Renova. I mean, the, the giving culture or the kudos culture, as, as I call it, um, because if you're, giving, if you're giving kudos, you're likely to get kudos in return. Mm -hmm. And that, that's just a, you know, I, I got to start this, the opportunity to start a corporation in a rapidly evolving industry and I got to start it in my image and to watch it perpetuate makes me feel good every morning because because it doesn't go the other direction and sink it actually grows so it, it for me personally I look at it and go okay I mustn't be too bad of a person that you know I must have been raised well uh, thanks to my mom and dad I have an older sister who is our corporate counsel at Renova and I have a younger brother who uh, is, is living in LA and he's got our our godchildren there and I'm just, just every day very fortunate. I consider Renova my family, and Absolutely. it means it means that much to me. And you, you are extended family, you know. As, you are for sure. You know that. You know, yeah. as, in as much as you yeah. want I'm to be adopted, so I'm the adopted brother that you, you, know, you really brother. want, but you, like you inherited, and and uh, you have no choice. <laughs> I worry about you. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Sometimes I sincerely worry about you, but you always, you're a cat. You land on your feet. Mm -hmm. You land on your feet every time, man. Drop you off a building. Texas, for God's sakes. Nobody thought Texas would start to grow in the renewable space, in the DG space. Holy hell. Wind, maybe. Yeah, because a bunch of greedy bastards with their open farmland decided, hey, this is a great way to get some tax breaks, but not in, in, in our space. And look at you. Look at you, right? That talk exactly, about man. <laughs> talk about timing. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. so. Um, Vince, you said around 2016 you launched your ESOP. Can you kind of tell me what like what happened overnight? Did you see an overnight change in the culture of your company from before the ESOP to after the ESOP? Or did it take a little bit of time to really sink into people that wow, like I'm I'm an owner of this company, even even if it's you know minority ownership. Um, you know, tell me about that cultural transformation, if there was one, um, and and what that was like before the ESOP and what was like after. Man, these are great questions. Look at you go, my man. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's an excellent question, because to be honest, I hoped that the transformation within Renova 
within all of, we call them Renovians, within the Renovians, I thought it would be faster. Instead, the public picked up on it much faster, that they were dealing now when, when someone would come to their home with a Renova, you know, energy shirt on that they were dealing with a, uh, a, a partner, you know, with an owner of the company. Mm-hmm. And so that, that was the most dynamic shift part. You know, I would be out and about and people would recognize me and say, you know, all oh, this, that's wonderful that you're making your employees uh, partners with you. And that, that I can feel confident when someone shows up to my house that they're not just an hourly employee, but they actually have shares and that those shares will appreciate in value uh, every year as the company appreciates the value of their shares would. And I thought, wow, wonderful, people are getting this. The sad part, Mo, is that no one, none of the Renovians were really understanding what they were getting. They were angry at me because they, I took away the opportunity to, uh, for them to invest in an IRA. But the problem was only 2% of the Renovians were investing or taking money out of their paychecks to put into an IRA. And that was the impetus for me to say, well, if you're not going to invest in yourself, then I'll take my shares and I will slowly give them to you so that you have something should you decide to, to retire from Renova five years, seven years, 10 years down the road. So that that's where this all began. And it is an everyday, my sister as corporate counsel has taken the ESOP program on as her, as her child. She, it's her responsibility to, to constantly update the Renovians on, on what an ESOP is. And the cool thing about it is ESOPs are not losing in popularity. They're actually increasing in popularity across the United States. And it's a wonderful way to invest in your employees future for them. I mean, I have I have a half a dozen examples of folks who left Renova for one reason or another, meaning they were moving out of the state or they decided, you know, I, I, this solar thing, this is great. I want to do my own thing and I want my wife to be involved and I want my kids to be involved and I want to start a mom and pop. And there's at least a half a dozen situations in the last four or five years where those people left cashed in their ESOPs and they walked away with fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, which they were able to use as, as just startup capital for their own companies. And, and I'm, I'm proud of that. I mean, I, I still talk to these, the, these smaller mom and pop microgrid integrators in our region or in Arizona. And you know, it, it's, they were able to start up because somebody invested in their future. It wasn't them. It was, and, I, and you know, God bless you. If you want to leave Renova because you want to do your own thing, I don't want you to be here and be miserable for God's sakes. I mean, that would be horrible. So spread your wings and go, go try. And, and I want to help. And that's what these shares do. The one, if, as, as, okay, so as business owners who are listening to your show, the ESOP has myriad of benefits, tax benefits, um, uh, 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 retirement benefits for you as an owner. And I would advise you to talk to attorneys who do put ESOPs together. An ESOP will run you between seventy-five and one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars to start and and to for the first two years to, to get the program in place. There are all sorts of costs where you know you need you'll need accountants involved and all that. So it's a little costly, but one one major tax advantage is if I am at the end of the year my net earnings are uh, you know say a million bucks every year we end up with a, a million or a little over and I've got to burn that cash somehow or I need to pay you know you're going to pay taxes on it now, I don't mind paying the government the more taxes I pay the more successful I was for God's sake but I would rather take that money that cash those earnings and I contribute that to the ESA in shares I get to distribute that. To all of the the Renovian employee partners in the in the state of shares, and then I will get you know then, then there's an equal write off for whatever I'm willing to contribute in mm-hmm. earnings. So there are benefits on both sides, but overall the entire company benefits. And like like you said, uh, you know there there are it it has to be adopted. The idea you know we don't have a country where the government tends to. Um, how do we say uh, um, promote, uh, you know, kind of employee stock ownership or employee partners, you know, employee partnerships or um, uh, what do they call those? The more community 
I forgot what they call those. Um, like communal giving and, and just, you know, investing in the people that work for you. They're just like, oh, have a 401k or do 401k. Yeah. What the hell? That's it. That's the limit of their, of their creativity. You're, and that's mm-hmm. it. So, so how do you get employees engaged? Well, employee, you know, pe- employees are people. They're all brilliant. They're all incredibly intelligent. They ain't stupid. So when you when you tell them, you know, you're going to work for me for 15, 20 years and I'm not going to give you any shares of the growth. Well, you know, that's you know, that's tantamount to telling them they're worthless and they're only worth an hourly wage. So as far as employee retention, you know, when when someone understands you respect them enough to bring them in to the growth or the positive growth of the company, uh you know, they're, they're going to tend to stay with you longer because they recognize that you respect them. So retention is great, is much, much better now, actually, after the ESOP came in. But it did take a little to understand that, hey, this isn't a game. This is real money. After a year, you get these shares. There's a value. You'll get a stock certificate that says what the value is. The next year, Renova's stock value has risen every year. We, we've been profitable every single year for 15 years. So we continue, and every year, you know, again, you have a, a your accountant has to do evaluation. So what? That's like eight grand a year. They do evaluation to figure out what your shares are worth. But that's fun to me because I love to show growth to all of the employee partners. So yeah, anyone considering an ESOP, I would say run, don't walk to uh, to your. I mean, that seventy five thousand or one hundred twenty five thousand that you're going to spend it on it is, you know, really. Uh, two or three or four hires um, that you're right. going to have to train brand new, uh, bring them in, uh, give them the tribal knowledge, uh, hope that they fit uh, the culture, hope that they you know last for a couple of years. So it really seems like an absolute no brainer for right. um, anyone that's building a, a long lasting you know business. Um I, I remember the last time I was in the desert, uh, what was it, last October, we came by yeah. and saw you. Yeah. I asked you about exit strategies, and uh, I remember verbatim you said, uh, fuck an exit strategy. Anybody that starts a company to sell it is really not a following purpose or legacy or contribution. Um, and I just kind of wanted you to expand on uh, that mindset and that philosophy. Yeah, well, that's what the ESOP, for example, that, that's what it is. That's what building a brand, uh, you know, your logos and all the firsts that you accomplish, those are all just steps in creating a long-term relationship with the market. And I, I why would you get in something if you were just going to get into it and, and you knew that after the, you know, the 1000th time that you woke up in the morning to to you know to engage in that business that you were simply going to figure out a way to get rid of it i mean that's like getting married knowing you're going to get divorced what mm-hmm. you know, just date her or him yeah. for God's sakes, why, why why bother with the ring and the ceremony so to me business is a marriage it's a commitment to your your customers and remember your customers and i know everyone says this and it sounds trite but it's goddamn true your customers are also your employee partners first and foremost man those are your customers and then of course your customers out in in the marketplace but you have a relationship that you have to foster with them right and so why be dishonest with them that you're actually got one foot in and one out the door ready to sneak that's just mm-hmm. bullshit if you want them to be sneaky on you you be sneaky on them people are not stupid people know when someone's purpose and heart is in something so if you truly want your heart in it, start every venture, making it limitless, making it an infinity. And and the ESOP, so the ESOP is a safety net. Let's not be naive also. There's a, I, I had said this probably eight minutes ago, where there's a retirement aspect to the ESOP. So you may not have to declare the day that you're leaving the company or stepping down, but the ESOP allows the company to grow at an organic rate so that when and if it can support paying the founder a fee to continue the company and to let it grow, I don't consider that giving the company up. I consider that passing the company on. And I would Mm -hmm. much rather be in a business where the mindset of those who 
are the executives is about let's pass something on that we can be proud of that will continue to last. And that's that's what the ESOP allows you to do. You, you're not just you're not going to sell garbage because, you know, uh, uh, you, you've got people who are going to live on in the legacy of that business. I'm not just selling it for one price and then and then moving on, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and that's so it's just being honest with your customers. And, and again, like I say, your employees are not just family, but they're also customers. Vince, you've been pretty outspoken in the Coachella Valley uh, when it comes to the policies of the utilities out there. Uh, you know, uh, oh. net metering 1.0, 2.0, now 3.0. Yeah. Um, you know, you wrote a book, um, you know, uh, Cut the Core. Uh, you know, which I feel like should have been called like cut the cancer. Um, but uh, I like that. <laughs> I, um, I wanted you to talk about the history that you have in, in this, you know, uh, really this this battle that you're you're going out there and you're not taking a backseat. You're not being passive. You're not one of those guys that's just going to take you know, rules as they are and say, well, the rule, a rule is a rule and I got to follow it. Um, I want you to kind of talk to us a little bit about your, um, you know, your longstanding battle with the utilities out there and, you know, maybe give us some context as to what they're trying to do and how that's impacting your business. You said the show's an hour. Yeah. 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 So yeah. yeah. All right. Well, then I'll make this, I'll do the Cliff's notes version of it. You would ask this question. This is what I wake up every morning doing. So, so it's inherent in my blood and my family. My name is, I, I wrote this in the book, actually. My name, Vince Battaglia, in Italian is Vince Battaglia. Vince Battaglia literally means to win the battle. And Battaglia is battle, Vince is to win, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I just, you know, my father is also Vince. He's Vince Sr., though, Vince Sr. Um, it's been, an, it's just... You know, we know so much that if we were to try to impart on every one of our customers outside of our um, employees, if we try to impart how much we knew, Mo, you would bore your customers to tears because you could tell them everything from the technology to the politics to the permitting, all of those things. Well, we know when there's something wrong and something amiss in the technology side, and we'll address that with either the manufacturer or we'll go find a better mousetrap, right? We know that when it comes to politics, if there's a politician who supports us and they support assembly bills and and, and HRs and, and things that support our industry, well, we will vote for them and we will support them during election time and we will put campaign signs in front of our businesses. When it comes to utilities and the games that they play, uh, we know better than anyone the games because we work with them. Our greatest competitor if you were here down the street from me, first of all, you would never be my competitor. You'd always be my love. You'd never be a competitor. But our greatest competitor mm-hmm. are the utilities. Whenever anyone asks me, who, who's, your big, who's your big competitor out there in the Valley? It's Southern California Edison. Yeah, well, that's kind of a big one. Yeah, that's my only competitor. Mm-hmm. We, have, we're, we are bifurcated in our territory here. We also have a, a group of indignant uh, cartel uh, operators called the Imperial Irrigation District. Uh, and I have a couple of, of fun uh, legal actions going on with them because they just don't know when to shut up. And they, they, uh, bat- they decided back in 2016 to unilaterally pull the plug on solar without, without telling anyone. And they created their own program, which is called net billing, which is a joke. And it, it essentially just took solar, which was growing, growing, and have it, had it drop off of a precipitous uh, cliff there. Um, so when, when, but we know that history because you and I work in it every day. So who better to publicly challenge those indignant utilities than us? If not us, then who? Because I'm getting phone calls all the time from people who, who unfortunately live in the Imperial Irrigation District territory, beautiful land as it is, but horrible utility. And they say to me, can I get solar? Well, yeah, you can get solar, but you don't get the financial benefit from it at all. You're basically building infrastructure. You're adding a power plant to your roof and you're giving the entire benefit 
to the utility. That's what they want. Why, mm-hmm. why would you do that? You know, you, and, and, and they say, well, because my neighbor across the street, they have solar. Yeah, but they're in Southern California Edison territory. Mm-hmm. That's an investor owned utility that up until about a month ago was playing ball with solar because they had to. They were required by the California Public Utilities Commission. You see, the IID is not regulated by the California Public Utilities Commission. Mm-hmm. They can just be a cartel on their own and do what they want. And there isn't anyone who can say what their five member board can approve or disapprove of. So solar is dead there. 2016, they had approximately 2,900 solar systems installed. Fast forward five years, and there are another 400 systems. That's it, 400 added. And the reason is those poor 400 people have been lied to and scammed on by out of area integrators who have just preyed on them. And, and, and by the by, probably 200 of those 400 systems, the integrator just didn't know that the IID did not have a net metering program. They didn't know that there was a net billing program and they sold the system to the homeowner and the homeowner was excited to go into the solar era. And then as the paperwork started to come in, but by the way, there is no program down in IID, so there's no program facilitator. So it takes six months just to get interconnected. So during the six month period, all of a sudden, probably 200 of those installers looked at the paperwork and went, oh crap, what's this? You're only getting paid back at this rate and you don't get credited all the way, you know, compound credits at the end of every month, all your kilowatt hours go away. Oh, and then you're you're regulated to only a system that's 100% of your historic load. You can't do 125% to anticipate electric vehicles and things like that. So all of those rules just decimated solar. I know this, so I'm not going to keep my mouth shut. So I have grandstanded. I put billboards out. I do radio ads. We do internet ads to let the public know they're calling me angry because I won't, you know, I because I, I dissuade them on the truth. You know, I use the truth to say, don't, if you buy solar, the payback is never. And, and I can explain that to you. And then when you try to explain it, they get angry. The customer gets angry and says, well, I want it. Okay, this has probably happened to me at least a half a dozen times where someone got angry and then went ahead and did it anyway and called me after the fact and said, I need help. Some guy came into town, he sold me a system, and now the utility won't interconnect it or I'm not getting any credits on my bill. And, you know, I, I and I'm not the type of person who says I told you so. I'm just stupid that way. Instead, I'm going to I'm going to go push the buttons of the IID. But no matter what you say, no matter what you do, the politicians in that area, unfortunately, are going to listen to that utility because that utility is supported by unions. And those unions are in this state, unfortunately, in the state of California, the unions are in control of absolutely every single piece of legislation that goes through Sacramento. So that's that's the battle we have. So I fight at the federal level. I go to Washington, D.C., and we we walked Capitol Hill. We we did this up to until the Trump administration. We would walk Capitol Hill three times a year, and talk to senators and Congress folks about about solar and batteries. And they would look at us like it was hilarious. Mo, people from like Montana who would look at us like we were aliens. They're like, you can put a battery on your on your on your RV, and we're like, no, not RV. You would put it in your home. And then you could power all your electric needs. Or would it power your grill? Could you get a grill? Yeah, yeah, it would power your, is your grill electric? Yeah. <laughs> it's my barbecue grill. It's, okay, then yes, it would. But it's like, we are still in that nascent stage. No one, I mean, if the hand is the world, we're right here when it comes to understanding what we're doing to deliver the replacement for the centralized utilities monopoly. Mm-hmm. And so I just figure my greatest platform in, and the path of least resistance is to talk to legislators who can actually do something about it through laws. Because I talk a lot, as you you know me, but you love me, so it's okay. But all your people who are listening, all your people who are listening are like, what the hell, this guy goes on. Because I talk a lot, but I would prefer to speak to a greater audience. And for, you know, for the first 
six and a half, almost seven years, I sold every system in this company. So I would go and knock doors and I would, you know, I would, I would, I would make the sale. That's when, that's before leasing really came about, you know, um, when we were just selling things with cat with systems without batteries, but selling with cash. So I'll talk a lot, but the voice needs to be, be more baritone, needs to be bigger, needs a megaphone. Magnified. And that needs to be magnified. And that's why when you ask me, you like people. Well, yeah, I like people because I like their smart brains and I like their big mouths. The more people that you and I bring into this industry, the more you and I can do one-on-ones with them over a glass of wine. And now we have people who can now go on and tell two more people and then two more people. And we grow the base of, of knowledge through through it's a forced way to grow it because the government ain't going to help us because the government loves to support oil and coal and all of that because those are entrenched institutions that have been around for 100 plus years. And that's how lobbying is done. You and I don't have the big bucks yet where we can go and get the buy the megaphone. So we mm-hmm. have to schlep it. We schlep it. We walk. We talk. But the best thing to do is to bring people and grow your organization because a powerful, the most powerful voice is a concise message that comes from one single organization. And, mm-hmm. and keep organizing with under the, the renewable energy flag, you know, I'm having issues with that now because we have SIA, the Solar Energy Industry Organization, which is our powerful lobbying group in Washington. And I really do feel sometimes they are, the majority of the times, they are really representing the interests of the utilities, mm-hmm. of utility scale, large scale solar. And Mo, like you know, man, not all solar is good solar. Mm-hmm. If you use the word solar, you're doing good with it. Anyone who's building a utility scale solar system, I'll tell you right now, they're bad because all they're doing is generating electricity out here and using transmission lines with all that line loss and all, and they're abusing that, that beautiful piece of pristine land and they're charging you retail and ever increasing retail for that electric. When you could put it distributed, distribute that generation on rooftops like you and I do. And, and people who are mounting that on their roof, they get all the benefits. They get the economic benefits. They get the environmental benefits. They get the emotional benefits, all of that. So that's good soul. Mm-hmm. So I feel SIA is really leaning more towards helping the utilities out. The reason is, is because they know where their, their, their bread gets buttered. You know, yeah. those utility scale guys, you know, they spend a lot of money. That's it. Follow that, right? Mm-hmm. CALSA in California, the California Solar and Storage Association, amazing. They know that guys like you and me, we're humping it. Mm-hmm. We're humping it. Each person, we're there to teach. We're there to educate. Without us, you know, we, we take we take it personal, you know, that it's it's our mandate and our purpose to grow this industry, to replace the dirty and the centralized distribution model, which is antiquated, which is getting more and more expensive, which has placed more costs on this United States economy than any other prior industry. And I don't mean just costs like your monthly bill. I mean environmental costs. I mean future costs. And no one counts that. No one calculates that when they think about cost. Mm-hmm. But you and I know that. Mm-hmm. And, and you and I, we give those arguments and they look at us and they love to poo-poo it and go, ah, oh, you greenies, you whatever. Well, fuck you. you. Yeah, I like I like to breathe good air. I Same. mean, uh, you know what I mean, right? Mm-hmm. So, okay, you guys stay in your corner. We're going to beat your ass. The way we're going to beat your ass is every day Mo and I are going to get up at the crack of fucking dawn and we're going we're gonna to work our rear ends off. And we're going to bring good people in and we're going to have a great culture. And we are gradually going to replace what we know is wrong. Absolutely. And we know those utilities are on the wrong side and they are kicking and friggin' screaming and net metering 3.0, the abomination that it is, it's come to, you know, we have to expect it. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's like um, Gandhi's, Gandhi's four steps. I think I may have told you this. Gandhi always says, historically, there are four steps in an evolution of an industry. The first is that there's an entrenched institution, right? When a new idea comes in, that entrenched institution will ignore that disruptive new idea. The second step always throughout history is that they'll ridicule it. They'll laugh at it, actually. Mm. Laugh and go, oh, my God, it burns. It goes on fire. Solar makes people, 
you know, have sex with trees and, you know, whatever they're going to come up with. The third is that they fight. And we are in the third stage of the historic Gandhi methodology here. The four stages, they fight, and they have been fighting over the last year and a half. The greatest fucking point of this story here is that the fourth stage, without yeah. fail, historically, they lose. They lose. The French institution loses every single time. The disruptive technology replaces. Mm -hmm. We've done everything we can over, I have over the last 15 years to kind of kowtow and be quiet, just install, 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 and say to the utilities, you know, we're not your replacement. We're, we're really an alternative. Well, bullshit, 2021, that changes because net metering 3.0 is the utilities just open kimono. We are here to shut all distributed generation down. It does, and, and what are they using as their excuse? They're using poor people. They're trying to say that the poor are disenfranchised and that they will not be allowed to, to, to participate in the solar generation. Mm -hmm. and, and so therefore we got to slow, we got to put the brakes on and we've got to allow the utility to remain in control of the generation and delivery mm -hmm. of electricity. Uh, come on. Propaganda 101, right? I mean, the, they're just uh, doing whatever they can to slow down uh, the adoption and whether that's um, saying, you, you know, you saying the truth or not, which obviously they're not, um, you know, they're going to do whatever it takes to slow it down and then to, to point the blame elsewhere and not not at themselves. And how are um, you in Texas? Tell, tell me, please. I, I, I gave you. Yeah. So, um, you know, it seems like net billing is like the story of Texas. Right. I mean, we we have a deregulated energy market in Texas. Uh, but there are a lot of pockets that uh, opted out. So they're, you know, they own the generation assets. Um, they, you know, negotiate and have, um, you know, power purchase agreements with different generators. They own all the cold metal on the grid uh, and then they build the end users. So that's kind of like what you see in, in California a lot. Uh, but then uh, the areas that are deregulated, um, the cold metal, you know, and wires companies are different from the generators and different from the retailers and the retail energy providers can really determine whether they want to offer a buyback plan or not. Um, and so you have this really, really, um, you know, complicated, complex market because not only do you have to figure out which utility are you working with and what their net metering policies are and whether they credit you at a wholesale rate or a retail rate, uh, whether they let you roll your credits monthly or they cap you at the end of that month. Um, but then you also have jurisdictions with all types of different um, you know, different uh, codes and, and policies. And then the worst of it all, all right, that maybe you probably don't have to deal with as much uh, are the HOAs. I don't know if you deal with HOAs out there. 650 in the desert. So, okay, yeah. so, so yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, that, you're right. You're right. That is such, that's interesting, man. You should talk about that because mm -hmm. that is one of the least really talked about hurdles in our industry. Yeah. I mean, even in 2011, the state legislature in Texas passed a law, House Bill 362, prohibiting HOAs from prohibiting and restricting solar panels. Okay. Yet so many HOAs within their restrictive covenants have language that is directly contradictory to state law. And they think that they're, you know, um, protecting the homeowners and the value of the homes in the neighborhood by prohibiting solar for some right. odd reason. The value of the home. Yeah. yeah, right. I mean, or, and all you have to do is do a simple Google search that says, you know, will solar increase the value of my home? And you'll right. find, you know, supporting evidence from the Department of Energy and from the National Renewable Energy Lab and from Zillow and from, you know, Association of uh, Home Realtors and, and, and it's all over the place. Um, but, you know, we, we deal with a lot of HOAs that are just very stubborn. And then I have to pull my counsel and get them involved. And then they typically shut up and, and let us through. But that that still impacts our profitability and impacts the uh, cost, the soft costs associated with going solar, knowing that we have to, you know, ha have these battles. 
Uh, whereas like, you know, they should be promoting this. They should be advocating a 21st century aesthetic, right, for renewable energy and saying, well, you know what? I may not like the way solar panels look, but you know what I don't like even more? I don't like the way a coal plant looks. I don't like the way the gas plant looks. I don't like the impacts that they have on society. I don't like the transmission lines and how they have to constantly be upgraded. I don't like the transformers that keep blowing out every time my neighbors buy an electric car. I don't like the vulnerability to blackouts, brownouts, all of that by natural disasters or (laughs) terrorist acts. Yeah, keep going. So I I could go on and on, but like where is that 21st century aesthetic being developed, right? And who's promoting it? Who is talking about it? Um, Who's understanding it, right? Why wouldn't the government? You would think that Mm -hmm. in such a transitory time Mm -hmm. on this last monopoly, the state governments aren't cooperating with the Fed or the Fed just isn't making a demand. Now, I get it. That's so naive of me that each state has its own sort of indigenous energy policy. But the sun brings all of us under one indigenous umbrella. That sun is capable of lighting up the homes in all, all, forget the geothermal crap. Sorry for anyone who's in geothermal. Forget, I mean, let, let's, let's get to where we're at here, solar and battery storage. So my point is, why? Why on this planet do you and I have to spend our neurons on figuring out this transition on our own dime, our own energy, making the HOAs budge, making the politicians listen, making the indignant IIDs play ball? Why are we having to be responsible for this transition into the new energy economy when it's going to benefit the entire United States? when it is all in place. We are paying for the infrastructure transition. Could you imagine if that would have been the case with the Ma Bell breakup? If like cell companies, the T-Mobile and all that were actually the ones who had to go state to state, person to person. They did in the beginning for the first couple of years. And then the US government created an umbrella mandate. Why are we 15 years into this when everyone knows exactly those same tr- those same troubles you just talked about right now are the ones I had in 2006? Difficult HOAs. Everyone poo-pooing what we're putting up because it's ugly. Or it's a, w- w- all right, so let's find a uniform, agreed regulation, and let's let's make that the universal law, the universal application for this transitor or this transitional economy. But no, it's falling to you and me. And I don't see an end in sight. And why is that? Because I'm seeing net metering 3.0 come up like a mushroom. And I don't see the politicians stamping it out going, oh, my God, this is dangerous. This is going to ruin this. This what we know by default it is going to be the transition. It's we are. I mean, we are going to win this ultimately. Like I said, you brother, remember those four steps, right? Gandhi said it. Believe what he said. We are going to win this. But for God's sakes, where's the cooperation from the policymakers? When a 3.0 comes up like that, or we just recently had a bill called AB 1139, which is just basically an even more archaic representation of 3.0. They're actually trying to pass Mo an assembly bill before this net metering uh, will we'll go in front of the California Public Utilities Commission at the end of this year. They're hoping to pass the bill, the AB uh, 1139. They're trying to pass it in the next couple of months. And so where is the governor looking at this bill going, oh, hell no. Oh, hell no. We know exactly what you're trying to do, utilities. Hell no. Where is he? He's nowhere. Who's there? CALSA, the California Solar and Storage Association. Renova. Mm-hmm. Out there using our time, our efforts, explaining to human beings why 1139 is that is the, the scam funded by utilities. Look what we're doing. We are responsible. It's on our shoulders to noodle and to execute an entire transition. Mm-hmm. And, and, and once in a while, it just gets a bit frustrating because I know, and you know, mm-hmm. 10 years from now, when we're having a glass of wine, we're going to turn around, look at each other, and we're going to laugh at the politicians and say, we fucking told you so. We told you that the transition would be away from centralized utilities and that they would become a 
wire management organization and that the generation and distribution would would come from solar and battery storage all right so we know it's going to happen you know i i'm i'm expressing myself maybe people have heard this for the first time or many many times but at whatever level you're at i i know this to be true otherwise i would not work in this industry every single day seven days a week and and to grow it Vince, I love your passion, man. Um, remind me to never get into a bear fight with you, especially after I learned that your name is to, to win the battle uh, yeah. or probably even to conquer the battle, right? Yeah, um, it's, it's okay. Not you, though. <laughs> We're friends. Um, I want to switch gears just a little bit and maybe move to more of like a lighthearted subject. And yeah. I, uh, I remember when I was in college, so I, I graduated and then I went and I did a social impact strategy program in 2015 at the University of Pennsylvania. And that's actually when my professors also started to encourage me to, to use frameworks and flush out my vision on paper. And, and they helped me distill that I wanted to be in the distributed solar and storage space. That was kind of when things really started to make, make connections, right, for me. And, um, you know, in, in addition to obviously the ESOP and all of the incredible uh, work that you do for your employees, you're also extremely active in your community, right? So you do a lot of work uh, with different nonprofits, uh, different uh, socially impactful organizations. And I just, I feel like maybe you know this, maybe you don't, but along the business model spectrum, you definitely fall in that for-profit with social impact. And that's kind of where I began, right? I designed my organization in that right. sense. Yeah. Um, but I feel like you are just you that 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 was you from day one. And maybe you, you didn't even know that. Yeah. Um, so uh, tell me a, a little bit, you know, about what you all do in your community, some of the organizations you all support, um, how that benefits your culture or the people uh, that are around your organization. Um, and why why are you so committed to it? Wow, another good question. Look at you go, man. Um, OK. Uh, you know, to be honest, when I first, I'm just fortunate that I get to give back to the community. I mean, think about that. If I if I didn't have, you know, the success in the industry and and get the the brand recognition that we have, nobody, you know, and if we weren't a pure brand, nobody would want to be affiliated with us. So to have people who are even interested in being affiliated with Renova, uh, it, you know, excites me. In the beginning. From a business practical standpoint, when you only have two dimes to rub together and one of them has to be used to buy a, like a, a top ramen, you know, uh, that you can add water to, which is what I lived off of for the first three years, you know. But it's good to know that they have chicken, shrimp and beef. So, uh, <laughs> my diet was diverse. Um, but, but when you only have two dimes, what I would do is I would just make sure that um, the company would give to events that would sponsor employees' uh, families. So a son on a basketball team, a daughter on a softball team. And, and so we would sponsor those local events like that. Uh, it wouldn't really bring us much recognition because it's a banner and, you know, I mean, that it was kind of static, but it was more about telling that employee that we're family and I, and I got your back. Your child is important to me because mm -hmm. that child is the most important thing to you. So. That's how it started. And then as time went on, uh, people attend those baseball games and people who work for heart associations and who work for uh, organizations that do that. When I was younger, I would always, I would, I would, they were so clear in their messaging that, uh, that even I, as a young, young kid would know that they serve a purpose and they're focused on that purpose. Um, uh, United Cerebral Palsy was is one of those organizations, and we have a very well run uh, one here in the Inland Empire. And so, when I had the wherewithal and got to a point, I I knew that that was one organization uh, I wanted to give back to. Also, uh, anyone who gives relief to animals. Um, so we make sure that there are two organizations out here in the desert that that we participate with. Um, those are those are very difficult jobs. I mean, those not all the animals find homes, you know, so thinking in those terms, I've got to be able to do something to make 
uh, you know, those people who work there and donate their time, the, the last thing I want on their mind is how they're going to be able to buy food for the animal uh, or with United Cerebral Palsy. I, I don't want them to be concerned about, you know, how are they going to hold an event, you know, that where where they can get all their clients out to participate. Um, we also, whenever, I like firsts as well. So I, I we have out here a really neat opportunity to connect the West Valley with the East Valley along a trail that runs through. And next time you're here, there it's getting connected. So we'll have to go take a bike and go through, um, it's called the CV link. CV is, is short for Coachella Valley. And it's the link of the Coachella Valley. And so when we, we knew that, I knew I wanted to be a part of that to make sure that that became reality because I saw there was a lot of pushback from different cities. And I'm thinking, how oh, the hell with you, if it's gonna take a little bit of money, to make sure that we can make that CV link, you know, to actualize it, well, then I want to participate. So we were able to leverage our rela a relationship we have with a local nonprofit. And, and what we did was we would pay their clients to spend the day, you know, tidying up the, the link. They, it gets them out. Mm -hmm. They provide, they can, they can participate in the community. They, you know, and, and so it helps their clients as well as, as solved the problem because one city didn't want the CV link to go through it because they said there'd be too much trash. There'd be, you know, all this and that. Well, there's always a solution. Mm -hmm. So I'm just glad now that we have the wherewithal as a corporation. Uh, it, it, it can be money. It can also be hands. We have a lot of hands on deck. So whatever it takes to, to help nonprofit organizations who, who's one missing, you know, their one missing link is, is usually financial or mm -hmm. volunteers. So we got that covered. So I know that's a long answer to your question, but that's keep it up, man. I love it. You you're doing some some incredible work out there. I I know that um, batteries are an extreme challenge right now. So uh, personally, we're running about a negative 110 power wall deficit. Um, Tesla was in my offices last week. Uh, they told me, um, you know, Mo, we're, we're uh, launching a premium installer network throughout the country. Um, you're going to be one of 25 premium installers and one of two in Texas. Um, it comes with this myriad of benefits, but I'm sorry, you're also going to be uh, impacted by the uh, shortage of, of batteries. And um, I just wanted to kind of run, run that question by you and see, you know, are you also uh, being affected by the shortage? And uh, if so, you know, how are you managing expectations? How are you managing cash flow and business operations? Um, and, and you know, what what are you doing to sort of come up with audibles or, you know, different options that you can, you can come up with to yeah. service your clients? There's no magic to it, my brother. It's, it's our attachment rate is, is now six in every 10 systems we attach a battery to. We are the top certified installer in Riverside and Imperial counties for Tesla. Uh, we are now nearly 250 batteries shy. Right, right now, even as a top, as the top CI, uh, if I was to sell you a battery, it would be a year and a month until we would get it here. So mm -hmm. it's clear that Tesla didn't come out of the you know the pandemic as well as they thought. Um, you know, God bless them. God bless Elon for being eccentric and and out there but without that man we wouldn't we wouldn't move the ball uh he's great but i think what they did was instead they found their higher margin product in their vehicles and they opted to move their batteries to their vehicles and not to the power wall twos that you and i uh, put out there so uh, the brass tax of it is you you do have to manage your customers expectations you just have to let them know that it's a year and one month from renova and if you're willing to wait then great we'll sign you up now, what we do is we then just pre-wire. We put our solar up under one permit. We pre-wire the battery, and then we'll come back when the battery comes in. Before, we used to put everything, battery and solar, under one permit, and then you wouldn't get paid on the job until you install both. And then we noticed that it was a three-month lead time. It was a four-month lead time. It was a five-month. So we just decided we're going to do two, two permits on it. So, yeah, brass taxes, just manage expectations with customers. Because by the way, brother, where are they going to go? They're going to go to your, 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 you know, your local another integrator and try to get it in less time than than Mo can. I mean, that that is that is what it is. So let them know. You'll pre-wire for them. You'll put it in when you get it. 
um, and show them all the emails that you can that come from uh, from Tesla that show. I mean, that yeah. proof. <laughs> I mean uh, again, it's just it's just brass tacks. That's how you have to do it. So absolutely, Vince. A uh, lot of tactical takeaways uh, from our conversation. Yeah, I, I think uh, for for our listeners, you know, uh, think about um, you know giving, having that giving first mentality. Um, give to your employees, you give to your community, uh, you take care of yourself, which is super important too. people forget about themselves and all of that. And um, sacrifice, you know, the first several years of your business, um, I can definitely relate to that, you know, not making any money, uh, sleepless nights, uh, lots of doubts about whether you're doing, you know, the right thing or not. Um, you know, uh, standing up for justice, you know, battling against the utilities, against, you know, the jurisdictions, the HOAs, um, you know, success does not come easy. And a lot of people think that they can just, you know, read a book about how to make a million dollars and then, you know, get depressed when they don't make a million dollars in an afternoon. Right. Um, so I think you're you're the, a testament to um, what it means to be a, an ethical uh, and an empowering leader that has given back to himself, to his community, to his employees, uh, and even to aspiring entrepreneurs like myself uh, back when I was sleeping in tents um, at, at uh, expos where everyone was in the five-star villas. <laughs> so I really, really appreciate your time. I really love everything that you're doing out there in the Valley um, you built an amazing business. You should be super proud, super happy. Uh, tell Nate, Isaac, Matt, and the rest of the gang that, um, you know, Mo sends all of his love. I, I can't wait to see you guys, hopefully, uh, in New Orleans for SPI. And if not, we'll be there. We're going to yeah. be there. So, um, you know, we'll come by. Uh, we'll grab dinner, do a little Mexican restaurant again. Uh, it's yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, right um, much love, awesome. man. Awesome. Yeah. Man, thank you. Absolutely. You Absolutely. We'll talk to you soon. All right, Vince. Wow. Thanks so much. Thanks. Much love, man. Take yeah. care. Ciao. Thank you for listening to Thinking Green with Muhammad Abdallah. This episode was brought to you by Good Faith Energy. For more information, check out goodfaithenergy.com. Make sure you subscribe, give us a review, and leave a five star rating. If you like this episode, share it with a friend. See you on the next episode of Thinking Green.